You're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman. Today's guest is Tracy Silverman, who is a truly inspiring musician in every respect, and it was such an honor for me to meet him and to be able to record this memorable episode. We talked about his classical roots, studying with legendary teachers Lewis Kaplan and Ivan Galamian, his rejection of the classical world, and his fascinating career through his years in rock bands. We even talked about some of his early gigs, including learning the ropes as a strolling violinist, getting the job as first violinist of the innovative Turtle Island String Quartet, and the development of his strum bowing method. We talked about many musicians, including some of his collaborators and mentors, including Terry Riley, Daryl Anger, Roy Futurman Wooten, Mark Wood, and composers Roberto Sierra and John Adams. Lauded by BBC Radio as the greatest living exponent of the electric violin, Tracy Silverman's groundbreaking work with this extreme electric violin defies musical boundaries, and you get to hear him demonstrate quite a bit in this episode. A leader in the progressive string community, his strum bowing method has been adopted by players and teachers all over the world, and we talk about his strum bowing and he shows us the basics. Tracy Silverman was named one of 100 distinguished alumni by the Juilliard School, and he's performed as a soloist with many of the world's finest orchestras and has had many violin concertos composed specifically for him by Pulitzer winner John Adams, Terry Riley, Nico Muley, Kenji Bunch, and others, as well as being the composer of three electric violin concertos of his own. In this conversation, one of the many topics we covered was the new concerto written for Tracy called Ficciones by Roberto Sierra. Finally, we dived into his creative process, how music affects our emotions, and how to stay open by listening to others and learning to show up as ourselves. Good morning, Tracy Silverman. Hey, Leah, how are you? I am so glad. happy to meet you. This is really awesome. Just, <laughs> likewise, um, likewise. I've been enjoying the uh, the episodes. They're so interesting. The folks that you're interviewing and the perspectives, very, very cool. Well, thank you. And I've been listening to your podcast a lot. <laughs> ah, thanks. Um, yeah, and it's, um, yeah, it, I think you're the first. Well, I talked to one other guest who had done some podcasts a while ago, but you're the first guest I've had who's... Uh, you started at the same time as me with podcasting during the yeah. pandemic. It's interesting. <laughs> we weren't performing, so we needed yeah, other outlets exactly. for connection, right? Exactly. There's so much to talk about. You've just premiered an amazing new work by Roberto Sierra. Yeah. With the American Symphony Orchestra. And I was even interested to read about them. Like, what is this orchestra? And it's really fascinating, actually. Yeah, I think their motto is something like, we play music you've never heard before or something like that. And, and <laughs> accessible and free, like free concerts. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so they really have a mission to, to uh, uncover uh, stuff that either new stuff, you know, they commissioned this piece, so they're bringing new repertoire uh, into the canon or into, you know, into the concert hall, but also playing stuff that just doesn't get played a lot. Uh, sometimes historical stuff, sometimes, you know, fairly recent uh, contemporary music that, you know, as so often happens in the contemporary music world, something gets premiered and then forgotten, you know. So there's a lot of opportunities to, a lot of great music. Um, so it's um, so it's kind of an interesting, interesting mission that's different from a lot of orchestras. And you're also going to be playing it with some youth orchestras. And I thought it was interesting yeah. how the composer had to be mindful of not making the orchestral parts too tricky. Exactly, exactly. It was a real challenge for Roberto, who is just so masterful as a composer. Uh, in my experience in working with him, I've worked with a number of really good composers, and it's it's so interesting how different everybody's process is. Uh, maybe we can um, dig into that uh, a little later. Um, but at any rate, uh, yeah, it was a challenge for him, s several challenges f for him that were new. And I, I think he enjoyed because he, he's written a lot of concertos, actually, uh, and had, was just finishing an acoustic violin concerto while he was writing my electric violin concerto. So keeping all of these trains of thought separate is, was a whole other, uh, you know, triumph for him. But um yeah, a few things. First of all, the orchestra part had to be fairly playable and, and approachable so that youth orchestras can do it. Although the youth orchestras we're playing with are, are like professionals. Um, they are remarkable, uh, very high level playing going on. Um, but then of course the challenges of writing for an electric six string violin, which he's never written for before. And 
which a, a lot we spent a lot of time back and forth me just sort of demonstrating what these potentials are and different possibilities that he might you know sort of the palette of colors I was trying to lay out for him that he can that he could employ um and then given on top of that the fact that I kind of play in a non-traditional way so it's not just like oh I'm a concert soloist playing an electric violin with vibrato and and Russian bow hold and you know blah 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 or whatever you know um I really have a, a whole other vocabulary of of techniques and just sort of a uh an approach and ethos of, of what I want to, how I want my, you know, my voice on the instrument is not sort of a generic violin soloist that you can swap out. Oh, you know, I played the premiere, but, uh, you know, 15 other violin soloists can play, can play the piece. Um, it's a little different because there are techniques that are, you know, kind of not unique to me, but that are non-classical, shall yeah. we say. <laughs> So it's easier actually to show, like, I know you're willing to bust out yeah. your violin than talk about yeah. the stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, here, let me get it. What? So, yeah. So this is my uh, main six string that I play. This was built here in Nashville by Joe Glazer, uh, who's a great guitar maker and technician here in town. And I've got it running through my pedal board. I think you can hear that okay? Yeah. Is that level good? So, first of all, the, the instrument has two lower strings. Let me stand up here. Um, so it's kind of like a viola with a high E and a low F, or violin with two lower strings. Violin strings, viola C and a low F, a fifth below the C. So it's like your low F uh, fourth finger on the cello, low C string. So it's almost down to the bottom of the cello range. Um, but more significantly, it's only one fret away from being at the bottom of the guitar range. So that low F is like the very first fret on the low E string of a guitar. And that was really where I started my whole journey with electric six string violins was a journey to sound like guitars, basically. Uh, and I can explain that later, but uh, right now I'm just going to demonstrate for you a few things. So uh, so technique-wise, uh, in terms of playing-wise, without getting into like effects or, or anything like that, um, one of the techniques that he used is the chop, which, you know, a lot of people uh, know and use. Um, but he was using it kind of creatively where sometimes I'd be chopping triplets and putting polyrhythms into all of that. Uh, sometimes there's fours and I'm adding little triplet um, subdivisions in there, the kind of Casey Dreesen stuff, you know. That kind of stuff. So he's using that. He's using... Um, uh, and actually, I should demonstrate, I have, uh, I created all these different sounds that I programmed for that, and certain things, like for the chopping, I use that because it brings it out better. Uh, there's a sound that I use for this, what I call percussive bowing, it's something I've been talking about um, in blogs and, and in my teaching, but it's this idea of muting the strings, like guitar players do, and playing, you know, those are completely um, dampened sound, just percussive. Which, there's a variety of sounds you can create with that, and the whole, the beginning uh, of the third movement starts off with these big orchestral hits where it goes, bam, and then there's like three bars of rest, and then, bam, like another big hit. And in between, I'm he has me doing stuff like, bam, check, back, 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 check, check. ricochets and all this kind of stuff but it's all this muted percussive playing um so that's kind of not your standard issue um you know juilliard technique um one of the other big things i'm using a lot is distortion in this piece but because it's not just a tone 
a lot of these effects change the way you play the instrument and, and what you're capable of doing. You have to, if you're using distortion, you have to dampen strings, otherwise they just ring. Um, even when they're just left open, they'll be ringing a lot and you have to, you know, so there's a lot of technical things in how to use some of these effects. But one of the effects that he used um, really effectively, I think, I was telling him about with distortion, and distortion essentially is, um, uh, you know, uh, amp distortion like guitar players use to create uh, rock and roll sounds, you know, like a... That grindiness is the distortion, uh, which you can program all kinds of different distortions, but... Uh, I programmed a pedal so that I could bring the distortion in gradually and have different amounts. So if I wanted to go like, or a little bit, all the way to that, so all these different gradations of distortion. So there's a pedal that's actually controlling the amount of distortion. And then I, it, what he's um, using is this uh, idea of subtraction tones. So if you take two notes on a violin, because of the bow, it's kind of a unique situation um, because we can sustain in a way that guitars can't. I can play two tones, like uh, these two notes, this tritone. And if I put distortion on it, you'll hear a third note. it into like a dominant seven chord I'm not playing that note so it's a really cool thing and he uses that in this uh, in the second movement where I'll be bringing in distortion um, stuff like that so th those are some of the uh, less classical kinds of techniques. And of course, the way I'm using vibrato is also uh, quite different. You know, going for a more, what I call a vernacular style. You know, even if it's something like he's got a melody at one point that's like... Or like you know, something like that. And I can play it sort of classically like that. Or I can play... It, You know what? Whatever I was kind of improvising there, but um, that kind of thing. You know, the approach to a melody can be quite different from the classical style. Hope that's helpful. Any other things I could uh, that you might um, have wanted, well, wanted to see? Yeah, or? maybe you want to play a bit more later, um, or if sure. you, want, you know, if you have your. I'm just looking at your. Um, I know you've developed something for acoustic players to have their violins yes. self-supporting. Yes, I am working on it right now. In fact, with, with Joe, the guy who mm. built this instrument, um, we're working on a basically a version of this, which is a neck strap and a chest support, or like a shoulder rest, basically, yeah. uh, and which are going to be able to attach to an acoustic instrument securely. It will be the world's first lockable shoulder rest that will not fall off an instrument. And the world's first neck strap for violins and violas hmm. so yeah so hoping to get that on the market later this year i've been working on it for about 10 years i've been working with a patent lawyer i've got two patents on it already and you know it's just like an ongoing drama but uh, we're getting closer <laughs> that's what i'm told for those people listening to the podcast who can't see so tracy doesn't have a chin rest he so it's you know you've moved the violin up at the beginning of your rock and roll yes. career it was really far down yes it was that's interesting you noticed that. and you had to use a tiny bow because you couldn't reach it's that, exactly yes i was playing the violin more or less the way you would play a guitar like down across my belly you know when i first got started just like way down there with a guitar strap under my arm so it's basically like playing a a little guitar with a bow except it's tuned in fifths um and because it's so low down there, yes, I was using a like a quarter size bow because otherwise 
you know, you got all this extra bow you can't use. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't really get out of first position. You know, it was a little bit ridiculous. But uh, it it taught me a, an approach to playing the to playing chords, to playing rhythm, because I was basically be, uh, uh, functioning as a rhythm guitar player while I was singing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted it low so that it wasn't interfering with my chin right because you can't sing if you're holding up a violin and i didn't want it near the microphone where i'm going to hit keep hitting the mic with the bow so i just kind of dropped it down here i wanted it to look I, you know i wanted it to sound like a guitar i wanted it to look like a guitar um and briefly you know a short story for for that explanation which i i said i would give <laughs> is that all my friends you know, my peers were not into classical music for the most part. The kids in high school were just the average, you know, kids were listening to rock and roll. This was in the 70s, you got to remember, when I was in high school. <laughs> it's a very long time ago. Um, and rock and roll was, was you know, the coin of the realm. I mean, that was the, the lingua franca. That was what everybody spoke and, and liked. Uh, and I wanted to play music that they got. I just wanted to play something they didn't think was old-fashioned you know, hoity-toity classical music, whatever they would think if you played a violin. It was instantly old-fashioned sounding compared to electric guitars and Jimi Hendrix and Led Zepp and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's what everybody listened to, and I wanted to speak in the language that they understood. Uh, sort of that's the more intellectualization of it. The main reason was I wanted them to think I was cool. I wanted them to like my music and think I was playing something cool and not old fashioned. So, uh, so that's how that started. Um, and as much as I always have to, you know, give the explanation that uh, I love classical music. That was my first love. That's what I start. That's why I started playing the violin. And since I was a very little five year year old kid, I sort of fell in love with the sound of the Sibelius Violin Concerto. I wanted to be able to play that, and um, you know, Rondo Capriccioso, all that kind of stuff. You know, I had those rec. I was fortunate enough that you know we had those LPs in the house, and and I loved them. So. But, you know, at a right, some t somewhere in my teens, I figured out that I, I you know, I, I had really become that nerd ball kid, you know, who walked around school with a violin case and glasses and curly hair named Tracy. So, you know, that was a tough, tough road to hoe. Uh, and uh, I needed, desperately needed something that would give me a shot at being slightly cool uh and this was my solution so <laughs> so that's kind of how that whole thing started and but i went to juilliard and when i came out i there was a real fork in the road you know and i was like okay parents and teacher and everybody else saying don't waste your talent you know pursue whatever it was contests auditions whatever uh chamber groups and stuff like that or what I ended up doing, <laughs> which was spending all my uh, available uh, cash and time uh, trying to start rock bands, uh, having a music studio I was paying a fortune for in Manhattan and hiring musicians some, at some points and knocking my brains out trying to play rock clubs in New York and all of that stuff. Sure, that within six months... I was going to be the first electric violin rock star because it was plainly obvious that this the time had come for for that to happen, right? Um, everybody had sort of exhausted the electric guitar. Here's something new, you know, Juilliard, blah, blah, you know, I can crush this. Fifteen years later, <laughs> I couldn't get arrested, you know? So... Um, uh, and then what ended up happening, I was just really pursuing this for years uh, with several different bands and different iterate, different time, you know, started off as a very commercial thing, then got into a really like hair metal thing. This was during the eighties, um, uh, when that was not an anachronism yet. Uh, and then in Minneapolis, after I left New York, it became sort of a grunge band thing, very influenced by... Soundgarden and Nirvana and just really heavy, almost always a lot of distortion and rock and roll. And I was singing the lead singer for all this time. 
And that experience, I only, you know, talk about it because it's a very non-classical experience. And I spent a good 15 plus years doing that and living that life, which is kind of gave me this dual citizenship, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and and changed my experience in a way that's radically different from most conservatory string players um, who may have dabbled in that world, but maybe didn't really give everything up and put both feet in it. And, you know, I mean, I was creating this instrument which didn't exist, figuring out the gear, what to play it through. And, you know, the, the fact that I was holding it down here, I started to say that really changed my technique. Uh, and I discovered after doing that for 10 or 15 years that uh, I had sort of come up with this way of playing rhythm with my bow, playing chords for myself. That was not anything, it, it seemed very intuitive to me because it was what guitar players did because I was just trying to sound like a guitar, but it was very different from what I was taught at Juilliard. So I was sort of intentionally breaking down my old habits and trying to find and build new ones yeah uh, and having a radically different position helped in a way mm -hmm. and it wasn't until years later because anytime i would hold a violin under my chin my vibrato would go back to classical mm -hmm. or jazzy you know one or the other but if i put on distortion and held the fiddle down here i played with a completely different kind of vibrato i approached the strings differently with the bow um and those the sound of that and the position of it really helped me develop something kind of fresh and, and new with it mm -hmm. i saw so um you, you know you mentioned juilliard a few times and and you graduated quite young you're like 20. And yeah, I believe right. one of your old teachers was able to come to the premiere of the concerto. That's exactly right. Lewis Kaplan. Uh, he's doing great. He's still, um, he, he ran the Bowdoin Festival, mm -hmm. which a lot of Juilliard folks and, and uh, classical players are familiar with, a big music summer festival that was going for 50 years or something up there. Uh, and he just stepped down from leadership of that. He's in his upper 70s now. Mm -hmm. Um or excuse me, upper 80s, mm -hmm. upper 80s, he's 88, uh, which I just found out. And he came to this uh, to the premiere uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I said, because I had said in a newsletter or something that he was uh, about 90 years old. And he's like, I'm only 88. Hey, <laughs> but he's looking great and busy running this Bach festival that he does. And yeah, it's real. So, so wonderful to to see him there. And you know, we were talking a little bit about, you know, I was saying, hey, if it wasn't for you, I would never be here, you know, um, because he was a big new music guy back in um, at Juilliard. Uh, he founded the Aeolian Chamber Players, which uh, was a very groundbreaking uh, kind of ensemble because it was this mis mixed timbre ensemble, which nobody was doing back then, which was viol a violoncello, I think, clarinet, flute, piano, and there might have been maybe percussion or something. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of one of these, which became the norm for new music ensembles. But at that time, there were string quartets, there were piano trios, you know. So so they were groundbreaking, and he always had this attitude of, don't do something that everybody else has done. Um, and what ended up happening was it sort of drove me <laughs> sort of away from his world because, you know, he, he was telling me that to be original and to honor your original voice and all that kind of stuff and i honored it right out of juilliard <laughs> into rock clubs but uh which you know i think he along with my parents thought was a huge mistake for many years but uh it was it was wonderfully gratifying to hear him say that he really got it you know like he saw me playing was like you're doing something nobody else does and and now i get it. i see where where you were going all those years ago and how that led to this and you know it's really kind of come full circle for me just because i've been around for so long yeah <laughs> and uh but it's it's wonderful just to, to see that happen and to be appreciated um by people who are really mean mean a lot to me and it it you know it would be sort of heartbreaking if if he kind of you know said something like yeah, could you play with less distortion? It's just, I, I don't, you know what I mean? Or something like that. He didn't temper at all. He said, like, I, I get that you are following your vision and you're doing something, you know, original. And, and uh, 
it's to his credit that he's got a very open open, open mind in mm-hmm. that way. And you also study with the legendary Ivan Galamian. Yeah, I sure did. Yes, we were alternating weeks with Lewis Kaplan and Ivan Galamian. So how are those lessons different? You know, I'm a violin nerd, so I'd like to hear a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to remember because it was a long mm-hmm. time ago. Um, the lessons with Galamian were pretty uh, cut and dried. You know, there there was not a lot of talking. Um, you would go in, he would sit at the piano, you would play your Gavinez Etude, which for some reason he loved that damn book, Gavinez. And he would sit at the piano and just kind of gaze out the window and playing along the Gavinez on the piano. Really? Which is kind of weird because there are a lot of string crossings and weird, you know, whatever. Um, He's playing it on the piano without looking just by heart. There's 24 of them, you know, and they all sound exactly like each other. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I you should know I, I recorded all of them last year as one of my oh, pandemic projects. Oh, my God. Okay, yeah. so you know exactly what I'm talking about. That's funny. That's awesome because I could have used that when I was a kid. Um, uh, anyway, yeah, he, so he'd play them on the piano, just staring out the window, and then i play Bach. And he would listen to the Bach. Sometimes he would play it also on the piano. Um <laughs> And very few, very few remarks, you know, um, if I got a Boeing wrong, my first lesson with him, my very first lesson. (laughs) So I walk in and I've got the Bach G minor, you know, first movement of the first sonata. And I start playing with it and I've, you know, I've never worked with him before. He's sitting at the piano. He's got this kind of goofy smile on his face like this, kind of like a little bit surprised, you know, and I'm like, okay, that's the way he looks, you know an old guy. Um, So I'm playing through it, play the whole thing, and I played it exactly the way my teacher from Chicago, as I I just did transfer from the Chicago Musical College, and I was working with Deborah uh, Deborah Wood, uh, who's in Deborah Wood Schwartz. Anyway, um, and she worked with me for, you know, a year or two on this piece. So I thought I crushed it. I played it pretty damn well. And he gets up, walks over, to my music stand, shuts the music, and said, next time you play my edition, and left the room. (laughs) That was my first lesson. I was like, oh my God, I guess I should have played with his fingerings and bowings. That's really so, interesting. My st- my uh, my main teacher, Mauricio Fuchs, he studied with Galamian, so he would sometimes say things about him. And we'd play from Galamian editions, but he'd say, you know, Galamian wasn't a performer. You know, he was too uh, analytical, but he didn't know what worked on stage. So forget that. Do this. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting. One thing that he he said about the Chaconne, he, would, he was a man of very few words. But I, I remember that he did demonstrate and, and instruct me that each phrase, you know, starts on the second beat. And he was like, don't make a retard into the downbeat. And then start again, this is just, you know, it's not, not the way to do it. Just play to the end of the phrase, take a breath, and then start the next phrase. And I thought that was very interesting uh, and has really resonated with, with me. My whole approach to Bach is very, um, I think, more uh, like, um, you know, the Baroque players, uh, try to honor some of those things in terms of no vibrato and no retards like that. And those are sort of traditional um, parts of, of that playing style, which I'm not really terribly well acquainted with, but I sort of have arrived at the same uh, conclusions, but I'm coming more from a, a sort of, a, again, the pop music, the vernacular perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and trying to treat them really honor the groove in it is what I'm my approach um, because there's so much groove in those sonatas, all the dance movements and stuff, and it drives me bananas when I hear uh, string players, you know, playing the romanticized and and very um, rubato uh, kinds of style that's appropriate for Fritz Kreisler, but uh, I do not think personally has any business in in Bach but that's my opinion 
I, I went to try to find a version of, of what I'm talking about that I liked, and I was like listening to everybody's version of Bach, and I could not find one that didn't do that. It was like everybody, you know, all the great soloists, whether it's Yo-Yo Ma doing the cello things, Itzhak Perlman, whoever, everybody, nobody just plays it with a straight groove. <laughs> it's like, but that's my, that's my little thing. And I know you still play Bach regularly, but you play it on your six string electric. I do. Are you playing the cello suites as well? Uh, I haven't really um, dug into those as much, mm -hmm. mostly just the fiddle ones that I know better. And, you know, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's such remarkably good music and fun and just stuff that, you know, I kind of know. Yeah. <laughs> And you've done some cool um, kind of riffs on them. And also, I love your Beethoven 7 yes. uh, thing you did. Yep. It's really beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. There's one where, you know, it was all about the groove and honoring that, you know, there's something very rock and roll about bum, ba, 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 and not changing, you know. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's a little bit like Cashmere by Led Zepp, you know. da 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 Ba -da -da. You know, that's that's where I see so many similarities between rock and classical music. And and I, you know, my approach to classical music is very informed by that. Mm -hmm. Before we yeah. leave your early education, I actually read an uh, interview with uh, Deborah Wood Schwartz saying that you were bringing like oh, orchestral scores when you were like so young, like Mozart symphonies or something, because you're already fascinated with composition, which. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I, I, geez, I don't, I don't know where that interview was. I like to <laughs> I never dig saw deep. That. Yeah, <laughs> very good research. Um, I guess I did. Uh, I, I, I don't re really remember. I was, uh, you know, always very interested in in composing. Yeah. Um, and took composition lessons very briefly when I was about twelve for hmm. for about a year. Um. But yeah, I, I was a huge Mozart fan. Um, I do remember that that year when I was in Chicago, um, my dad had for some reason had these little mini scores of the last six symphonies, mm. and we had this fantastic Bruno Walter uh, recordings of it. You know, I had like the box set of three LPs, you know, with a symphony on each side, and um, um, and I just listened to the crap out of those things and followed the scores and was fascinated I'll tell you what what fascinated me uh, uh, about Mozart was how um how seemingly cheerful and light and elegant it always seemed and yet how it had this incredible heartbreaking pathos underneath and I just thought that was so cool how he underplays the drama of it and and made it so much more poignant because of that rather than being sort of hard on your sleeve the way the, so many of the romantic composers did which I also loved at that point I, you know um, I mean I was the first guy to sort of dig into Brahms and you know Tchaikovsky and all that kind of stuff but uh, but I really respected the fact that you know Mozart um, left so much of that to your imagination to fill in and and just the way he would he would do that and anyway yeah so I'm curious yeah. about your life, um, the intersection of like being a composer and an improviser, and you improvise in so many different styles as well. How does that work for you? Do you start with improv, or is that a different process when you're composing? Um, that's a good and a very deep question. I often do compose by recording improvisations, mm -hmm. uh, and then I pull from them. I'll save a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, that's one, definitely one of the, uh, the ways that I compose or have composed, um, just depending on, again, on the piece, the project, what it is I'm shooting for. Um, with my last violin concerto, the, um, uh, love song to the sun. It was, a, you know, really a big, you know, like a 25, 30 minute work that had a storyline and many different melodies and it was almost like writing a musical in a sense there was all these scenes and and uh, or a, a film score you know uh and you know that i really had to you know keep 
logs in notebooks of you know this theme here and this changes to that and that transforms to this and this theme and then it goes to this key and you know kind of structured work the whole structure of that was much less improvised um but uh often when you know uh, uh, big chunks of it were me going okay here i want to do this in this scene and i would just sit down at the either a keyboard or with a violin and just try a few passes at it and then take like i like this take i like this bit um put it together in pro tools um where i would actually might record something record a second track record a third track move stuff around add some keyboards to it go back take this one out re-record it and just kind of build it within the software that's a lot of how i work mm. It's interesting with the storyline because I know you had asked Roberto Sierra to consider using a narrative and then he used different yeah. short stories for the concerto. Yeah, which I think he he um, told me he really did not love doing. Um, <laughs> he, he kind of resisted the idea because he doesn't like this idea of programmatic music, which I don't really have a, a problem with. Uh, personally, but I know it's not every everybody, you know, composers that's often sort of either you do or you don't. So I said, you know, I just proposed that, hey, um, here's an idea, take it or leave it. And I think he, you know, he, he, he told me, you know, he was going to leave it. But then it kind of inspired him to think about, oh, well, I do love um, Georges Louis Borges as a, this Argentine author. He was like, hmm, let me think if there's some way that I could use these stories. And what he ended up doing was very non-programmatically uh, being inspired by the stories. And in fact, sometimes the inspiration um, was more of gave him just an idea for a compositional technique. Like in this one story where the, the character kind of... Uh, explores these 14 different doors the the, the minotaur um he, he took away the 12 different notes of the scale and started with them all there like all the doors are present uh where the orchestra would hit these big chords that contained all the notes and then little by little pairing them away till it ends with no notes you know there was just like then there's the e, b flat there's the e flat and b flat you know so he kind of went through and 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 uh, eliminated notes so not terribly programmatic way but inspired by something within the story so mm -hmm. that's kind of how he approached most of those stories and in one of your violin concertos uh, between the kiss and the chaos which ended up being recorded as a string quartet with violin but yes. it was originally a puppet opera yes and you know what's interesting on this tiny podcast i have i mean you're the third guest who's written a puppet opera like how weird is that it's not a usual oh art form right that's crazy. That's crazy. Well, I've you know I, I've actually never seen it done. I would be very curious to to see how how they approached it. It's a project that I I sure wish would have happened. It never happened. It's something I started uh, with this puppeteer about fifteen years ago. We were both uh, parents uh, at at uh, Waldorf school. We both had kids uh, in Waldorf school and in the same class who were best friends. And uh, and turns out um, that Brian uh, is this uh, sort of world famous, world class puppeteer uh, who uh, runs a, a puppet theater at the library. And he had this idea for called Masters for all of these great painters to uh, sort of reveal their masterworks. Uh, and he's not only a great puppet puppeteer. He's also an amazing artist, visual artist, painter, um, and uh, an operatically trained uh, tenor. <laughs> so uh, he wanted to kind of pull all these things together, create these puppets, sing these parts, and, and for me to write the, what he's going to sing. So that's how it started. Uh, and so we did three scenes, or two scenes. We actually only, only did two demo scenes on video of him doing that. One was the Michelangelo David and the other was Van Gogh's Starry Night. And uh, I did a couple of other, uh, George O'Keefe, um, and I had a couple of other ideas, but we, the project wasn't, didn't get funded. We couldn't figure out how to take it to the next step. So I had a commission to write a violin concerto and I said, you know, I'm gonna, I've got these, 
cool little vignettes that I was really enjoying and really uh, like loved what I did. I'm just going to turn the vocal part into the solo violin part uh, and do it without words, you know. And so that's that's where that came from. Very cool. Yeah, I can send you after the links to these uh, these puppet operas. Yes, it's very it, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so when you joined the Turtle Island String Quartet, it's funny because I realized who you were because I found out about you through Julie Lyon Lieberman. And oh then, my goodness! And then I was listening. I was like, oh yeah, I used to love these albums. Like, and that's you know that sound I heard. But you were playing acoustic violin in that group. You had to yes. Yes, yes, strictly acoustic, and that came right on the tails of of me coming out of like my hardest metal mm -hmm. band from Minneapolis. Gut Bucket was the name of the band, <laughs> and and uh, so I I just like veered from that, boom to like acoustic only acoustic violin, colored silk shirts, playing fairly traditional jazz. Uh, so it was really kind of a, a, a big pivot for me. And to be honest, I wasn't sure whether I should do it because it was not at all what I was looking for. You know, I was trying to become a rock star um, and was, you know, moving into this sort of more fringe area of rock to do it. Um, but it's, it's, I, I, Tell my students uh, to, th uh, uh, in terms of career moves like this, to think of it as a dartboard. And I'll give you a real quick my dartboard theory. You may, you, with all the research you've done, you probably have heard me say it. But it was just, it's simply like, you know, there are gigs like working at Cheesecake Factory or something like that that are not on the dartboard. Um, there are gigs, so the outer ring of the dartboard is the, is maybe, you know, doing wedding gigs or freelance, whatever. Uh, inner rings of the dart, like the center of the dartboard is being a rock star. Uh, right around that would be, let's say, being in a really successful rock band of somebody else's rock band or whatever. Uh, and outer thing of that, you know, you, as you move to things that are not exactly your bull, bullseye, but are on the dartboard. So um, Turtle Island was a successful, wonderful, amazing group that was not at all the the bullseye that I was looking for, but was definitely on the dartboard, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so I took the gig because it basically brought me to a very center, close ring of that dartboard, really closer than what I was doing playing in rock clubs, which was on the dartboard, but a very, <laughs> yeah. very further out ring on it. So but uh, anyway... Uh, so I ended up doing, you know, taking a big musical shift over to Turtle Island, but it was a huge learning experience. Um, and if there's any takeaway that, you know, um, you know, I, I would love for people to have from this conversation. Uh, I, I've had a crazy eclectic kind of career that I'm, that I'm very, uh, fortunate to have experienced a little schizophrenic, but, um, but I've experienced a lot of crazy stuff from this hardcore classical training to serious rock club you know nastiness um and 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 jazz with turtle island um indian music with terry riley you know a lot of different and they were all even when i was freelancing uh, in new york for 15 years doing weddings i was doing strolling gigs i learned a whole other repertoire and how to do that and how to get tips out of people's pockets um all the things you learn with that, playing wedding gigs, the freelance world, uh, it's all a learn, it's all an educational process and it was all kind of postgraduate work. Mm -hmm. um, learning how to play by ear on wedding gigs that I had no idea what was going on. Tra it was great training, for ear, tra ear training. So, you know. yeah, I'd, I'd run across this, this strolling violin thing too, which it intimidates the hell out of me, I can't imagine. So what, you'd learn a few yeah. popular tunes, like how would this work when you started out? Well, um, so I started out um, <laughs> uh, playing a, a weekly Sunday gig at the Yale Club that Stan Curtis, is uh, a the fiddle player who had the gig and did a lot of that. Uh, I was like fresh out of school, needed a gig, and through a friend of a friend, uh, they connected me with Stan. He's like, I'll take him on. He can help sub for me at the Yale Club. So he taught me the, the, the ropes of that. And there's a whole different repertoire. There are the French waltzes. There are about six or seven French waltzes that you play in a certain sequence in certain keys. 
and it's a, it's like a medley. Mm-hmm. It takes about six or seven or eight minutes or something. Uh, there's the Italian rumbas, same thing. There are the um, uh, uh, there are the the sh- the light opera things like um, Victor Herbert, uh, Vic- Victor Humans. Who is it? Like all that kind of turn of the century mm-hmm. weird stuff, um, sort of operatic light opera stuff, European kind of continental repertoire. So it was a whole repertoire that I had to learn, and it took me weeks to, to you know, of studying this stuff to learn it. And I was playing the harmony parts, mm. so I had to learn the second parts. He was playing the melody, and then finally I kind of worked up where I could sub for him, play the melodies. I knew the sequences enough to be able to call it, and you'd have like harp players, and they'd have to, they would all know the sequence, and you just kind of go through. So there was all of that stuff. There was strolling tables, which is uh, like in a restaurant, which was a little different because a lot of that was taking requests and knowing memories from cats and and lara's theme from dr zhivago all of that kind of stuff was what we were playing of course i hopefully it's updated somewhat since mm-hmm. the 80s when i was doing it uh and how to be able to play fake your way through tunes that you've never heard before somebody like oh yeah how does that go can you hum a little bit and they'll be like and they're like okay oh yeah and they play for like yeah thanks yeah here's five dollars you know um yeah stuff like that leading uh wedding bands as a singer and knowing how to do like that whole shtick from here's a bunch of pop stuff for the kids and now here's rock and roll from the 50s for you know and now here's a couple of frank sinatra songs and i was singing all this stuff and you know and playing and then being in the uh, wedding, uh, the cocktail hour bands with the jazz groups and playing bossa novas and stand all the jazz standards, learning those by ear, um, how to call the keys, flats are up, you know, it's like F, B flat, E flat, G, D, A, that's the way they did it in New York, um, stuff like that. So uh, all that stuff was a huge education, you know, uh, and really just... Uh, made me a much richer player, I think, than people who have had a, a more strictly classical um, education, who never really learned how to play all this other repertoire, whether it's this old-fashioned strolling kind of stuff, or jazz, or rock, or whatever, or uh, world music from, from India and all that kind of stuff. But it's the reason why when John Adams saw me playing one time, he was like, I would like you to do this because you have this weird combination of talents and it's hard for me to find a classical person. You know, he could have gotten Itzhak Perlman to play his piece. Um, but he was looking for somebody who didn't sound that way. So this was- so that's kind of the irony of, of, of you know of my journey is that my parents didn't want me to, but I never would have gotten to Carnegie Hall if it weren't for, for this weird journey that I took. Yeah. So John Adams wrote, uh, this concerto Dharma at Big Sur for you, which you opened Walt Disney concert hall, I believe. Um, and I just, for people who don't know, and, um, you've done an amazing little, uh, sort of arrangement where solo, cause you do all these solo gigs where you have the part. So you, there's a version of that piece you perform. Yes. Yeah, I uh, I have a solo program that I that I do just a one man uh, recital kind of thing with looping, uh, and I have solo versions of these concertos. So I have about a twelve or thirteen minute sort of suite from from Dharma where I'll play. I set up a loop that kind of replicates uh, as best I can the orchestral score, um, and then I play a chunk of the first movement, and then I add this rhythmic layer to that that replicates the score in the second movement. I play a chunk of the second movement. Uh, and I do a similar thing with the Terry Riley concerto where I'll have like five of the eight movements, little um, sort of suite of those together in about a 15 minute piece. Uh, I'm creating something like that for the new Roberto Sierra. I have versions of that of my concertos that I do. Yeah. Um, and yeah. let's talk about looping because you're pretty early on the scene, and I know in one of your things, Ax, uh, Axis and Orbits, you like yes. randomizing, which is really interesting to me. Yes. Because to yeah. me, the problem with looping is it's the harmonies don't change. You know, it's yes, limiting. It's exactly. more about rhythm. Actually, could right. you show us any looping? Do you have that set up at all? Or so, you know, standard looping. 
um, you know, you create something and then you play over it. And typically that could be something like uh, in its simplest form, uh, I could play a rhythm part for something like a... So I'm going to record, record this little phrase. So that's recorded. And then I can just play on top of that. You know, whatever. So, you know, that's like its most basic form. Or I could take that rhythm part and layer it. Layer the loops on top of it. I don't typically with this one, but just for the heck of it, I'll add some tones so you can hear what happens. So, so let's say... Now there, and I can keep layering on top of it. Now there's two I can add to that. So all of that can, so you can layer on top of a loop. So those are the basic kind of functions of looping. But what I did with this axis and orbits was in order to um, avoid the obvious repetitive nature of that, I recorded loops at different lengths. And, uh, and I did it in different ways. In some pieces, I uh, coordinated them so that they rhythmically lined up. So this, you know, let's say this one is 8 beats, and this one is 12 beats, and this one is 16 beats or something. So they had a rhythmic way of of intersecting, um, but you can also do it freely where you have a loop that's 11 seconds, you have one that's 24 seconds, and whatever, one that's six seconds. And they're, so they're cycling at different rates. Mm -hmm. And if those loops have chords or, or harmonic information, that information starts randomizing pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so I, I, I and my challenge was how do I solo over that when I have no idea what's coming and kept me on my toes, you know, um, and it's so I used it in the first movement of, of that piece. And actually, when I perform it, um, I do it a little differently, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, it's a little hard to demonstrate because it's kind of such a long mm -hmm. loop. <laughs> yeah. it, it'll take a couple of minutes to to do. But um that's the that's the the concept the idea of of that looping is that you know you can use it to surprise yourself mm -hmm. uh and to create uh challenges like that that are unexpected and serendipitous so sometimes and sometimes you know uh not really what you wanted <laughs> so for people just starting out with looping or curious yeah. they're, they're looping curious what do you recommend as first steps uh, well, you know, there are simple, uh, like one button loop pedals that are, you know, really easy to get involved with and, and cheap. Um, but if you, if you want to do stuff where you have different sections of a song where you can really kind of create a solo program and, and create, uh, arrangements that are using looping, uh, I use something called a boomerang, um, but there are a lot of options out there. I know Roland makes a really, uh, a really good loop station um a lot of them have clicks that will um quantize your looping so that they're seamless mm -hmm. uh so that the start and end point of the loop are exactly on a beat the boomerang doesn't do that you have to kind of nail it yeah. um so you know there's different different options yeah i was thinking i mean to me there's an overlap because i know your son uh does beats and you made an album yes. with him but That's right. To me, there's a bit of a mesh with that, with both those art forms. Yes, uh, yes, and, and uh, although the word, the term looping, loops, and looping can, is kind of uh, it's the same word, but it's when people talk about drum loops, they're usually um, talking about a sample of of a drum part, you know, yeah. uh, drum beat, um, and and when we're talking about what I'm talking about here is live looping. Yeah. Um, so you know uh, looping just recording loops um 
but uh, a lot of similarities in the fact that I'm often using this l looping um, rhythmically and creating some that, kind of a... That's what I meant, a, yeah. Yeah, creating some kind of a rhythmic part. Uh, and, and one of the things you can do with this uh, is you can have like master and slave loops. I'm trying to get this cable out of the way. Um, for instance, I can throw down a, a purely rhythmic part like a... So I'm just randomly making something up, um, and, and let me get to a sound here where I can do this. Um, I put on a bass sound, so I'm using an octave to drop my sound. So let's say put down a little thing, or I can do a a two bar. Right? Because the original loop is just one bar, three, four, repeating, I'm gonna do a two bar, so. Whoops. <laughs> I totally screwed it up. My loop is now three bars. Um, this is why this stuff is a little tricky. You gotta kinda work it out. <laughs> I meant to turn it off here, but I didn't. So it's on for another bar and then it starts again. Um, and then, so that's like a three bar thing and then I can play on top of it. Um, you know, and so I've got drums, bass, and a rock guitar and a really, uh, sounds more like a band than a violin player. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I'd mentioned your son and I was thinking you made that album during the the height of the pandemic, right? When yes, you were... we sure did. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, it was, um, it was kind of a, a, an interesting, fun thing. You know, I thought, well, we'll just do this as a father's son kind of thing. Cause you know, he, he was really getting into beats at that time, which he's still into and, and has gotten much better at. Um, but was, he was just getting started. I didn't even know he was doing that. He was just kind of taught himself how to do this stuff from watching stuff on YouTube. And I was like, what are you doing? Um, and uh, as a way to sort of encourage his journey with that and to respect that, I started playing on it. I was like, yeah, this is really good. I'm going to play on the stuff and make a record out of it. So, uh, so we ended up doing that and we were finished with it. Uh, and just about to put it out when the whole George Floyd thing happened and all of that happened. And suddenly it seemed like the idea of me and my son putting out a, a record of, of hip hop beats just seemed like a really, really bad idea. Uh, and, you know, our, my intention of it was, was to uh, learn about this music, to honor his, what he was doing and, and uh, I learned a ton. Uh, and for me to sort of play in a style that I, I found that it was very releasing for me in terms of my violin playing. It, it allowed me to, uh, to, pl to do a different kind of playing that, that I felt like I used to do more in my rock and roll days when I was just really trying to sound um, as non-classical as I could back in those days, trying to sort of uh, set another course f for myself and my technique and playing. And, uh, and, I, and I started listening to, the, to this going, first of all, the, the whole, you know, hip hop world was fairly new to me. And he was really turning me on to all of these rappers that I had never listened to seriously and taken seriously. Um, and I was listening, and I was hearing all these cool subtleties of the way they're put behind the beat and, and the way they're, the way the vocals are, are such a rhythmic part of rap, you know, so much energy comes from the vocal. I was trying to capture that without words on the violin. So it was a real challenge for me uh, as a violin player. And I was, and, and I thought, you know, what would somebody do who was like a young person who really knows and loves rap and hip hop? How would they approach the violin if they'd never been taught classical violin? had none of that 
experience, none of that um, sort of baggage, if you will, you know. Um, and so that was my challenge, you know. I was thinking of of um, Matisse, Henri Matisse, the painter, who said the hardest thing for a painter to do is to paint a rose. Because in order to paint a rose, you have to forget every painting of a rose that you've studied your whole life. Uh, and so for me, I had to forget how to play the violin. I had to say, how would I play this to this music if I had never heard a violin before? And somebody just put this in my hands and said, here, make some sounds on this thing. So that was kind of my my approach to it, which was very refreshing. And, and anyway... I, I was going to shelf the whole thing and not put it out because it just seemed like a bad idea at that moment. But a, a friend of mine who who ended up taking the promo shots for it said, "No, no, you you have you have to put this out. And what you're saying is important, uh, and what you're doing is important and positive, and um, and believe in it. Uh, and to that end, we took one of the tunes uh, called Take Sides and found this Eli Wiesel." Um, speech from his uh, acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize um, in which he uh, basically said we must speak out we must not be silent um, and that in I felt included me as a as a white you know a privileged white male as like hey I've got a responsibility to to speak out as well so uh, so that was that was how that happened it was sort of uh uh, you know, a interesting side, a personal challenge. You know, uh, for for what to do, what to do with that with that record. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, you'd mentioned uh, Terry Riley. I know you worked with him for many years, like in terms of a mentor and yeah. an influence. And I, the album you made with him is like totally different, again, type of playing. Yeah, Terry is. Uh, huge influence uh, on you know in my life um musically and personally um you know spending time a lot of time with him which i have over the 25 years or so that we've known each other um he's really kind of taught me a lot about how to be an artist what's important you know um his approach to music is so free and so um you know, it's such a, an integrity to what he does. Uh, and, and yet such a, you know, uh, has this wonderful integrity and yet this wonderful freedom where he, he's just fine with trying anything and, and going places and taking huge risks on stage. And, um, you know, we would, we would, I was, uh, in the trio with just me, Terry and Gian, his son, uh, for many years and and we would just go on stage with with a tune that had a melody and a very loose structure and one night it could be 10 minutes and one night it could be 30 minutes uh and he would just um you know he would just let let out the leash for us you know and just like say take it and run go wherever it takes you and some nights we'd get into a real heavy rock and rolly kind of thing i would just kick the distortion on and get into something I'd never really done with that tune before. And, and he would just be there on the piano, just smiling and so, you know, and there, and then he would go off into something that we had no idea. Is he going to a different tune? What is he doing? I'd look at Gian and Gian would be just like smiling, like, I don't know, <laughs> that's my dad, you know? Uh, and that was the way we, we played and performed and, and, uh, you know, worked together. Um, just, you know, huge. I interview a lot of improvisers cause I'm fascinated <laughs> with that. And I always ask people if they hear what they're about to play. And I've heard you say that you believe we have to hear what we're about to play. Yeah. Yeah. In the same way that you hear what you're going to say just before you say it. Do you, though? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But you do in that split second. So there's So that's the interesting... The timeline, I think, is is what you're asking about. Are you pre-thinking this or is it really truly spontaneous, right? How does that function? And if it's truly spontaneous, how are you able to make sense of it, you know, without mm. practicing it? And the answer to that is it's remarkably similar to this conversation that we're having. 
you have some ideas of what you want to ask me. I have some ideas of the stories that I want people to know about me. But the exact words I'm going to use, when I'm going to say them, completely unrehearsed, right? I haven't practiced, uh, you know, what I'm going to say. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm thinking sometimes slowly, but sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm putting my words together, hopefully just before I say them, you know, and not just after I say them. Uh, and that's the way our brains work, which is f fucking remarkable, um, you know, to understate it. Uh, the, the whole what, what's going on in our brains that allows us to have an idea and spontaneously communicate that using a shared language uh, is what, you know, what makes uh, the human species fairly unique, you know, um, although animals do a similar kind of thing. Um, but it's the same process when we're playing. The, the difference is that I have practiced, just simply practiced, the ability to spontaneously play what I'm thinking of on my instrument. And it's just the way you've, you learned how to speak. At first, you didn't know the words to things. Little by little, you knew them, and you immediately associated what you wanted with a word and was able to say it and communicate it. And that process just became, you know, uh, it took years, but it, it's something your brain developed because you needed it. Uh, and the same thing can happen on an instrument. And it, it, the easiest way to develop it is to simply sing along with what you're playing. And that's, uh, people think it's so difficult and such a parlor trick. And like, how do you do that? And, you know, it's sort of the George Benson thing of, you know, got some delay on here. Um, just get to a plain sound. Um, but uh, it, it's as easy as what I'm doing right now, just speaking. So I have an idea of what I want to say. I have an idea of what I want to play. I want to go boo ba da ba And you just kind of know if you if you kind of know you have to have a sort of an orientation of, of what your key is. Like what is A? You know, where is a, a reference point? You know, middle C or something. So if I go ba ba da ba, I know it's third to the fifth. It's a C major triad. I can just feel it. Now, I may not always have that intellectual thing, but um, often if we're playing jazz or something music, uh, you know, uh, something tonal, we have a sense of a chord. It's a D major chord. Now, I can ask you to play a D major scale or something, and any classical musician can do that. Um, I can say, you know, play a, um, play a D major scale in alternating thirds. You know, uh, any classical player can do that, and and that's really if you and if I said sing along while you do it. You could do that within five minutes of trying, uh, and that's the exact same process that I'm using to improvise with. So it, it's really. Um, most classical players are so close to being able to improvise and they just don't realize it, <laughs> you know? It's just a baby step away um, from what you can already do. Um, and it's just a matter of practicing it. And, and by practicing, I mean like a few weeks of practicing. <laughs> and you'll be able to like sing and play along to whatever you hear in your head. You hear it, if you see da 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 and you know that's a C. Okay, so you sort of orient yourself. And now if I go ba ba da ba da I just, I know where that is on the instrument. You know where the notes are on the instrument. Somebody, you've been playing the instrument long enough, the muscle memory is there. And it's just a, a tiny baby step away from improvising. So... Taking the magic out of yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I'd love to make it, oh, it's this thing you classical musicians will never understand. You have to spend years in the darkness. No, it's, it's, 
basically like playing, you know, you can play a scale in G major, you can improvise in G major. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of the improvisation I've been trying to do is not, not tonally based. It's not over harmonic changes. And it's okay. a little bit different and I don't have perfect pitch, so I can't always know, you know, but, um, yeah. Yeah. And not everyone has given the same answer as you as to whether they always hear, <laughs> but. <laughs> oh, Yeah. One thing I'd like to add add to to it, the improv uh, improvisation uh, story mm -hmm. thing is that one of the things that I've been teaching lately with stromboing is to use rhythm as uh, an mm -hmm. entry point to improvisation rather than notes and keys and scales and chords. Uh, so using that whole tonal thing of okay, I'm going to play in G major. Great, I know what G major is. Uh, I can I can do that um, to start from a rhythm rhythmic perspective and say okay the groove is ba ja ka ba ba ka ba ja ka da so I'm going to use that as a way to start and I'm going to go and find that there's all these rhythmic subtleties that I'm doing without even trying to just because they happen even when you're trying to play the same thing over and over again you'll mm -hmm. play it a little differently and if you give yourself a little freedom to do that you end up improvising rhythms now you may not think of it as being the most creative improvisation in the world because the beat is staying the same the subdivision is the same yeah it's a limited version you're not reinventing the wheel every time you do that but you are creating improvisations within that groove. And for rhythm players, that's a big part of what makes it work. That you're playing the same two chords over and over again, but it doesn't get boring. How is that happening? Like listen to, you know, Stevie Wonder play Superstition. And it's just the same, it's like one chord the whole time. Boom, 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 it's a it's dominant chord. But holy cow, every, he can play that for an hour and it's interesting. Now, you know, there's a, a very um, a perfected art of, of rhythmic improvisation going on there. You know, very intuitive, uh, effective uh, way that he's making us move physically because of what he's doing rhythmically. Uh, so, you know, um, I think it's a, a good thing for a lot of classical players to remember that you can do a whole lot of rhythm with a, a, a lot of improvisation with very few notes or with no notes. How does that Stevie Wonder tune go? You have your fiddle there. Can you play it? Oh, my gosh. You know, um, you know, I never really figured it out on fiddle, but it's like... I'm not playing it in the right key. I think it's in E flat. Something like that. But anyway, uh, you know, it's just kind of a, a cool, funky groove. If I was going to do it, I might do it in a different key. fluidity is astounding i just like trying to get you to play more. Oh. um i i have to say i went through your stromboing book and the etudes and i'm trying to get the chop oh, going you. and you'd be interested um with my orchestra we just played um well two really really hard weeks with super rhythmic music we premiered a percussion concerto by a uh, canadian composer nicole lise and her writing is really it's hard to read off the page. It's not beyond mixed meters. The meter changes every bar and all these loops. She's also a DJ wow. and it's this crazy long percussion concerto. And oh, wow. we played Rite of Spring on the same program. What the National Arts Center Orchestra of Canada here in Ottawa. Yeah. Oh, cool. And then uh, last week we um, played the Canadian premiere of the Wynton Marsalis Tuba Concerto, which had some basic jazz rhythms. But again, like often, like I listen to a lot of jazz, but when you're just seeing it on the page, it's not always so obvious. The, the feel of it, but especially with the Lise, yes. I have to say, and the Stravinsky, I use some of your ideas of ghosting, like fill it, filling in that way. It was fantastic. Oh, really? It saved me a ton of time. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So, you know, I mean, the idea uh, uh, for, I'm not going to get into a whole stromboing thing, but, but one thing that's, uh, I think, tricky for people to realize is that um, the idea of stromboing is basically uh, just highlighting the fact that 
um, you can uh, bringing out the subdivision of the beat, what I call the groove on. So, uh, and a lot of times as a melody player uh, for uh, violins, especially more so than cellos, and um, we're playing melodies that are are uh, di are not reflecting the rhythmic subdivisions. Uh, and it can make uh, and it can distort our our playing so that we don't honor those grooves. But um, I guess my point is th that the idea of, of stromboing is that you're constantly keeping this grid of down up down up down up down up. But in reality, it doesn't apply itself to a lot of actual music because you have to you know use a different bowing. So my example of classical music uh, that I use is the Beethoven seventh with that. Sorry, I keep turning my uh, battery off. <laughs> um, is that the rhythm is... So that rhythm often yeah. gets distorted. So instead of being... Da, 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 one, two, three, ba, da, 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 it becomes... Da, 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 da. Um, and so in order to put it back into its proper rhythmic uh, container, we need to subdivide it. So using this idea of strum bowing, you can go like that. And to feel that. But in reality, you can't really use that when you're playing it. It's not, it yeah. goes too fast. And, you know, But it does help you to understand the rhythmic integrity yeah. of, of it. So it's, I think, helpful in that sense so that you go to, okay, that subdivision, I'm not, you know, I'm not counting, basically, what my teachers used to, you know, what everybody does, you hold, you don't hold a long note long enough or a rest long enough, because you just like, oh, I'll just shorten that. But, you know, you're not respecting the grid yeah. underneath it. Anyway. Yeah, I had used definitely with my students, obviously playing subdivisions for long notes and stuff. But I had never tried ghosting rests in that way before this. And in this piece, we yeah. had things where we'd have loops where you'd have a 1 16th rest, and then later two sixteenth rests and three between your things and you can't use a metronome for that so you have to find another way yeah and that right. was the way <laughs> yeah oh yeah. very cool very cool i'm glad yeah. that was helpful um daryl anger uh, introduced you to the music of gismonti yeah yes he did and i knew the name but i hadn't really so i was listening to some of his music i was like oh i can totally see you know the connection there did you ever get to work yeah. with him I never did. I never have um, been, you know, the, uh, we considered um, uh, commissioning him to write a concerto, which I think would be super cool. So that's still an idea that's out there. Um, I'm just a huge fan. Um, I, I heard his music and I just, I went like, that's exactly the way I would write I, I want to write, you know, he, he was, he had this tune called Maracatu and there was this way he had this descending bass line by whole steps and, and just the way he was organizing it and all, it just spoke to me uh, immediately. Uh, but Daryl played, played for me uh, and Daryl Anger was brilliant for this. He introduced me to so much mm -hmm. great music uh, and he would just force me to, to listen to stuff. I like would be in a car, you know, back then with cassette tapes and he would just say, here, listen to this, you know, and, and I was always of, you know, I had sort of had a natural resistance to that. And, and I don't know why you'd think everything about, uh, about my values would suggest otherwise, <laughs> but there's some weird thing that's like, I got too much stuff in my head. I just don't, I don't need something new. Don't, don't show me an artist. I don't. And a lot of times it was fiddle players and I was just, I, I, as much as I have respect for bluegrass players and stuff like that, there's a limit to how much of that I really want to listen to. But um, just personal thing, like with old timey and stuff, you know, I'm good for a few tunes. But anyway, so he like I hear I got this this tape. I was like, ah. Uh. And then as soon as he started playing it, and it's this this tune, uh, Laurel. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's just this great tune, this Brazilian thing, and the recording is so amazing, what the drums are doing, and the way he's playing the piano. Uh, yeah, and, and it just uh, it became one of my favorite tunes ever, and uh, mm -hmm. huge fan. Yeah. You did a couple recordings with different percussionists, one of them, Kaito Marcondes. He's also Brazilian? Yes. Yeah, Kaito. Kaito. Okay. Um, yeah, we, uh, we met Kaito. Uh, we were down, we went with Turtle Island, went to Brazil in like 95 or something like that and played a festival down there. And I don't remember how our paths crossed, but Kaito then... Uh, uh, wrote a whole um, record, basically, that he hired Turtle Island to record. Uh, so he came to the U.S. like a couple years later. Uh, we did a whole record with him. And then after I left Turtle Island, I reached out to him and said, let's do a record together. We did this record, uh, North Meets South, and um, uh, which he came up to Nashville, recorded. Uh, we recorded it here. But then I subsequently came down to Brazil a few times to play on these percussion festivals and various things. So, uh, yeah, Kaito is an old friend, and he's still um, blowing it up down there, doing great stuff. I love that album, really. Um, That's great. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I love Brazilian music. I love the, the just the warmth and and humanity of it. For some for some reason, there's a an informality to Brazilian music that that's just so wonderful <laughs> not sure um what that is it's just part of the culture mm -hmm. that i love so you do a lot of teaching um at the university yeah. there are, are you teaching just strict rock or jazz or what are you doing with your students uh, i actually don't do a lot of uh, i don't have a lot of students at belmont university i just take one mm -hmm. or two a semester and i have an ensemble a jazz string quartet which is sort mm -hmm. of like a turtle islandy sort of stuff we'll do turtle island arrangements or new arrangements that the the kids write which i really encourage them to do or other arrangements of mine um and or danny like danny seidenberg from turtle island i just had him uh send me a bunch of his stuff and we're gonna do some of his stuff um uh but i do you know uh, online lessons mm -hmm. and and of course all the stromboing workshop kind yeah. of stuff which has been really kind of occupying a lot of my education yeah and you've time. written like string orchestra arrangements for strong bowing stuff to really bring it into the schools yep yep i do uh, a lot of stuff with with high schools uh and i'll often um write something new for them i just wrote uh something for the school in ohio um the string uh director of the of the orchestra there rachel gammon so uh, i wrote a piece called jammin with gammon i wrote uh, something for the uh, uh for some friends of mine up in aurora illinois the um and their uh, wabanzi valley high school and i it's called the strumming wabanzis <laughs> so um so i keep you know i take these opportunities to, to create new stuff that's that's basically illustrates uses strum bowing and uh so that in the process of playing a concert with the kids i can really teach them how to do this this mm -hmm. kind of stuff and it'll often be a situation where they will have a whole orchestra section mm -hmm. taking something that starts out like and then goes to and get them all to groove this together by keeping that subdivision going in your hand yeah. and getting a, a, a groovier style of playing violin than as it comes bowing which tends to yeah. be distorted so we talked briefly about daryl anger i know he was re really showed you the ropes um in terms of like because the touring you did with turtle island must have been so different than what you were doing in your rock days <laughs> yes yes which wasn't okay. touring at all which was just playing you know playing local clubs um so yeah no it was a huge uh you know the whole turtle island, island experience for me was uh, hugely educational again the the takeaway that all of these different things uh were just uh, educations mm -hmm. for me um yeah the the whole touring stuff and how to how to do all of that um 
but also playing wise, you know, Daryl taught yeah. me how to chop. What I was doing with my rock bands was mm -hmm. a little different. I was playing rhythmically and playing, playing rock and roll to accompany myself, but it was typically more mm -hmm. of a power chordy kind of stuff, like, you know. And I was, so I was doing stuff like this, more like guitar kind of like, you know, or um, playing very rhythmically, uh, but I was not doing this chop stroke really um, the way you would do it on an acoustic violin to bring out oh, the overtones and that kind of stuff. So, um, so he, he, you know, sat me down and, and taught me how to do this and it's subsequently become how I teach people to chop. Uh, but he was doing, you know, he was like, okay, here's the chop, it's a downstroke, and you want to make an upstroke, so you get two sounds. And then he would do like, you know, and then he would, you know, go like a... I was like, wait, wait a second, that is not this. <laughs> Those are two different things. He's like, yeah, it is, I'm just speeding it up, you know. Um, so there was a lot of in-between there that I had to figure out for myself. Uh, and... and the thing that I, I think I, I'm kind of proud of a, as a sort of um, teaching uh, invention is that I, I started teaching not just this chop, this simple chop stroke, but what I call a compound chop. Because I noticed what Daryl was doing is this, like doing two of them fast, not just going like down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, but going one E and a two E and a, so it was a four note thing and I noticed Casey Dreesen is also doing a thing he kind of thinks of it as a like a front middle back middle front so he's got a little different approach to it but I was you know finally and just in an attempt to try to explain what Daryl was doing to people uh, because I could kind of imitate him but I didn't know quite how I was doing it and so I finally broke it down and I realized so I can teach this as a compound chop and then that's the basis basically for a vertical version of strumming where we're able to keep subdivisions which are typically 16th notes um, so if, so we need to be able to divide a beat into four parts rather than just two uh, and so that's what this was able to do and so then I realized okay these are both doing the same thing they're both subdividing the beat one horizontally and one vertically but musically they're accomplishing the same goal uh, just in different parts of the bow. So I started thinking of, of all of this rhythmic playing as strumming rather than chopping versus mm -hmm. shuffling. It was all kind of yeah. subdividing. And that's kind of where the whole strum thing started. It's interesting when you were saying like you were a little resistant to like don't put on another cassette because as a, as a performer, like <laughs> often I just don't want to listen to music. It's just like I... Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just... People always ask me, you know, like... Uh, you know, like non-musician friends, what are you listening to these days? What's cool? You know, what should I listen to? You know? And I'm like, don't ask me. I, I do not, I don't like music. I don't listen to it. I find it, <laughs> I was once actually, I went so far as to tell somebody, I find it too manipulative. It's like, if I listen to music, it's like they're trying to get me into their mood. It's like, I, you know, I want to be independent of that <laughs> because it's really true. Music is very uh, manipulative of your, you know. <laughs> yeah, actually, that brings me to another question. Because um, I think in your interview with uh, Martha Mook, you were talking about how music can completely change your emotions. And she was saying there was this tune and she kept yeah. listening to it. It was bringing her mood up. Um, so I was going to ask you, actually, if the, is during the darkest days of the pandemic, if there was music you were going to, but maybe not. You know, there there's definitely stuff that that um, I can't listen to without smiling. And a lot of that is, um, is, is stuff like Stevie Wonder, um, that just Monty tune. Um, there's a Salif Kita tune called Africa, which is just, if you can't, if you don't dance to that, you're not. Can you play it? No pulse left. Uh, oh gosh, you know, I've never. <laughs> believe it or not, it's one of those things where it's like I love this record. I I would never even try to play it because um, I would never be able to do it. Um, it's just this great. Uh, Africa, Africa, Africa. Afro 
Pro Pop kind of thing. It's hard. Believe me, I'm not doing it justice. Anyway, it's one of those things that that just you can't yeah. sit still. You know. Um, so I I, I do I, I I love I do tend towards music that uh, is upbeat like that rather than stuff that makes me super weepy. But um, <laughs> uh, just because I'm I'm an easy guy to. to uh, to to get to cry for sometimes you know things I just hear music that just uh, well I should say Nessun Dorma things like that I, I uh, you know hearing Pavarotti sing that aria just instantly makes tears just fly out of my eyes um, and there are things that uh, pop singers can do like um, um, Aretha that I just I. Uh, did you see uh, Summer of Soul, the movie? Um, great doc um, about the Harlem Jazz Fest. And uh, who was it? Um, it wasn't Sissy Houston. It was a oh, great gospel singer. And just sitting there, the tears just streaming down my face. There's something about uh, often gospel music and, and uh, mm. music like that from, from the black church tradition that just... It's just hits such a so directly in such a visceral way that you can't help you just respond like like a yeah. nerve is hit you know it's it's funny anyway well I do still like music yeah well actually for, <laughs> for me like um <laughs> I just like this podcast that I've been doing has really helped break out of just listening to whatever to like focusing in on you know records a lot of my guests have made or stuff they're into so that's been pretty cool actually i go down a rabbit hole and hopefully yeah. my listeners follow and check out their music afterwards yeah your discography is is yeah, huge yeah. and varied so i hope people who've made it this far into the conversation will go and check out your many records <laughs> oh thank um, you we were talking about percussionists actually because uh roy futureman wooten you did a, a record with him that's a cool guy and he does like yeah. cool instruments cool like guy. that you can't see in the air like yeah yes uh you know he's um the percussionist drummer from Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones, uh, and many years ago, back in the 80s, started playing this drum guitar that he invented, which looked kind of like a guitar, but had pads, uh, MIDI pads. Uh, so he was really kind of uh, breaking ground at the time when that was a very new thing to have a, a, a sort of a drum uh, MIDI trigger like that. Uh, now there's a thing called a Zen drum, which is basically modeled on his first drum guitars. Uh, but he, you know, as amazing as all that stuff is, when he sits down behind a, a drum kit, he's just one of the funkiest, best drummers you'll ever hear. He's so much fun to play with. He just makes anything you're playing just sound better. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. It's just, he adds just a, a, a swing, a feel to it that just feels so good. Um, so yeah, we've been playing together for years as a duo and, um, that's you know, again, another person who is hugely um, uh, sort of a kind of a mentor in a way. I mean, I, I've learned so much from from Roy about being relaxed, uh, improvising, um, jumping into any situation. Um, but he's such a chill guy, and I can be such an uptight guy, and and it's such a so great for me to have somebody like that to model mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i mean had a you know just showing up to do a gig and, and just bringing yourself and just and just knowing that that's yeah. enough you know that's a whole lot to learn from somebody doesn't seem like that big of a deal but you could spend 10 years picking that up <laughs> I, my whole I mean? life it's been a, a, trying to get that i wanted to bring that up actually yeah. just this feeling of being vulnerable on stage and how improvisation must have helped you as coming out of this classical world that was so straight and narrow. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, mm -hmm. let me just put this down for a sec. I think the reason I do what I do uh, is uh, uh, because I needed a way to kind of create my own rules because I was just not comfortable having to fulfill everybody else's expectations of what a uh, classical violinist uh, does because, you know, frankly, I, I really got turned off to the whole Olympic kind of um, mm. competition of trying to play something with the fewest mistakes. To me, that's just 
so non such a non musical approach uh non creative approach so it's a funny thing you know performing you that's your job is to try to learn something so you're sort of bulletproof that you can get up and and play it uh and feel confident about doing something very difficult uh and people kind of come to see you do that uh and there's a certain amount of it as people are there to hear you tell a story uh to make a musical statement of some kind but there's also a certain aspect of that which is let's watch this virtuoso play something you know sort of like watching a basketball player or, or you know an athlete do something that they can't do uh and there's a thrill to that um but there's also a, a tight wire that the performer works because uh, walks because of that you know um but at any rate i guess the bigger picture is that i sort of was not comfortable doing that and playing you know standing up and playing the Tchaikovsky concerto that everybody has heard everybody knows and it's supposed to go like this and oh you didn't you dropped a note or you didn't do that or whatever everybody so I was like I'm gonna do something nobody knows how it goes either I wrote it or I created the style and nobody can tell me I'm not doing it right because it's my own little world it's my own little niche um and so I think a big part of my career was that it was just like let me create something where I can't you know, nobody's going to judge me on their standards because you have to judge me on my own thing. So whether that came out of uh, uh, some form of fear or or uh, vulnerability or uncomfortableness or, or what, um, but there was certainly a certain amount of moving away from pain and moving towards pleasure <laughs> in the whole thing of, you know, let me not do what everybody else did. Let me not be the 38th version of the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto in the catalog, which used to be the Schwann catalog, if anybody remembers. Um, uh, but let me try to advance the state of the art of string playing at the same time. So, you know, sort of both of those things happening. I think if that if that makes sense. So in March 2020, when the world shut down and our lives as performers got cut with very uncertain future, um, you stopped yeah. practicing for a while, right? It was a yeah, it was a a difficult time for me actually. I was just uh, intending to dive into the stromboing um, project of creating these online courses. So I was about to do that um, anyway, uh, as it happens, and I was about to start a, a podcast to sort of mm -hmm. be related to that and to try to start building community around what I was doing. Um, so I was sort of taking a turn away from um, performing and into this more educational kind of pursuit. Uh, but I did... Uh, intend to have some income to <laughs> to make that transition possible, and when the rug completely got pulled out from under me for the for a period of a year, uh, with zero income, uh, and, and relying on as a freelancer basically, which is the way the state unemployment system saw me, uh, I was not eligible for anything. Uh, because they did not have any unemployment for self-employed people in Tennessee. So I was completely, you know, I ha had the national, uh, you know, the money that they were sending out, which lasted for a couple months, whatever. Uh, so thank God my wife had a, a, a job, was able to keep her job. But um, so I, uh, I'm not sure what, you know, uh, what you uh, were a asking exactly about about that moment but it was a very difficult moment for me because i basically wanted to start this new transition to a sort of a new business and was planning on making a lot of investments towards that and buying cameras and and the software to run the back end of the marketing you know it's, it's a lot that goes into starting a business um and really couldn't had zero wherewithal to do it suddenly. So it was very frustrating. Uh, and so this sort of ended up making that record instead <laughs> and doing my best with one camera and an iPhone and then, you know, sort of upgrading as I went. But uh, it was a struggle. It was a struggle and very, very demoralizing uh, for me personally, uh, partly because I turned 60 right 
like two weeks after the pandemic hit, like the first week of April is my birthday. And, and so it was right then. And suddenly the bottom dropped out. I was like, wow, all my future plans for this business just seemed unreachable. Like, you know, how are we just going to keep the house? And, you know, and so they had a house full of kids at all, you know, my grown kids showed up from Chicago and everybody was living here together. And we were all kind of quarantining together. And, you know, it was just a crazy moment career wise for me and, and age wise to sort of turn 60 and suddenly to, to feel like I had, um, you know, no future for the time being, <laughs> you know, it was a difficult, very difficult position to be in. I really struggled with that for a while. I, I didn't, you know, I haven't really talked about it at all. And, and because I think everybody struggled and nobody wants to hear about my struggle, but, um, if it makes anyone feel any better, I did have a rough time for that first yeah. year. It was really, rough. um, what helped get you through it? Um, work doing, doing this work, just doing what I could do at home and hoping that, you know, just trying to make my time useful um, and hoping that at one point it would, you know, the money part of it would balance out and would pay off. Um, since I couldn't go out and earn any money, I could create assets, create a record, create music, create video, create, be creative, uh, and productive, uh, and figure out how to invest in that later once I had some income rolling in again and how to because, you know, you can create anything you want if you don't have the wherewithal to bring it to the public. It's like a tree falling and nobody hearing it. So, uh, you know, so after creating all that stuff, the the whole job of bringing it to people is is a whole somebody else's job, typically, and somebody else's money. Yeah. But, <laughs> of course, in our world now, this is part of being a musician is being an entrepreneur and and. Uh, I think that's something a lot of your guests have spoken about in, in your podcast is, you know, how are we all as creatives um, coping in, in this environment? Because holy cow, it's not enough to just do your work anymore. You know, I'm, I, it, it was a, it was difficult to, to find yourself in a position where you could do that ever uh, because you had to either have a record deal or a, I don't know, a college teaching position that allowed you to, you know, have work, you know, time to, to work or something if you're a writer, but, um, it, the whole dynamics of how we create a space for ourselves to, to mm -hmm. create, uh, is tricky. It's really tough. And I've had to learn a lot from younger people, from students, uh, how to use social media, how to use, you know, and things that I don't avail myself of. There are, you know, people using Patreon and people using Kickstarter, blah, blah, blah. There's all kinds of ways of funding funding yourself. Um, you know, I tried to do things that hopefully will work for me. And, um, and it's difficult also, I think, being older, being a little more established. It's hard to do things that kids right out of school will do and can do. And there's a sort of, uh, I, I don't know, you know, it, it's, it's tricky. I found myself in a funny position where I was sort of this, um, <laughs> it's a friend, friend likes to call it, you're a world famous starving yeah. musician. You know, I, I found myself with a reputation that a lot of people knew of. And yet, I, I, you know, I needed a gig, you know, I would have taken a wedding gig at, in the middle yeah. of the pandemic if I had one, you know? Uh, so it was a, it's a funny position to be in. Mm. And this uh, Ficciones Concerto, did that help you get practicing again? Because that sort of got going. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it did. Uh, it, it kicked my butt. <laughs> it definitely got my got my fingers in shape fast. Um, yeah. Uh, thankfully, I've got a great manager, Brian Horner, who um, put t this commissioning project together. Um, it's really what he does. One of the things he does really well is uh, gets a consortium, mm -hmm. a, an orchestral consortium together. So he got uh, the American Symphony as the lead and the Vermont Symphony, um, Meridian, Miss Mississippi, the Richmond Youth Orchestra and, and San Antonio Youth Orchestra. And now we have about a dozen other orchestras who are who have now uh, become really interested in it. 
uh, after the success we had at the premiere and good reviews and we have a recording coming out of it and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, his job is to get all of these, put all these pieces together. Uh, and he managed to do that uh, really kind of during the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic when orchestras said, no, you know, we're going out of business. We're not taking on any new projects. We're not commissioning anybody. We can't even pay our players. Uh, and somehow he managed to find enough people and we managed to work with Roberto to make it affordable and to pull this off. Uh, so kudos to him and uh, to the orchestras for taking, uh, continuing to take chances on new music, which is always a difficult thing for them to do. Uh, so there was a lot of things that lined up, uh, and, you know, I'm so grateful to, to have a new piece to work on and to have something to sink mm -hmm. my teeth into and, and to be creating new repertoire, which is really what, uh, my mission to put stuff out there so that other six string electric violin players besides me will play yeah. this stuff. I'm happy to, 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 uh, to be the first one to, to do the, some some of these pieces, but I really am hoping that I'm not the only one. Um, uh, you know, there's a, uh, a Rudolf Hocken at uh, University of Illinois has a six string doctoral program, electric violin, not six string, an electric violin doctoral program that he's doing. And uh, a friend of mine, Matt Bell uh, and Chuck Bontrager, two, two great electric violin players have are taking it, getting their doctorate. Uh, Matt is actually using my uh, concerto as one of the pieces that he's mm. working on. Uh, so th this is all stuff that was just a dream uh, when I started doing this in the 80s, that anybody else would ever be crazy enough to play an electric violin, let alone be able to get a degree in it and to have repertoire that other people can play. So, you know, it's uh, it's very gratifying to see how the world has changed in the 40 years, you know. Yeah. I mean, you were building literally your, your first instruments. Yep. Yeah, yeah, with Mark Wood back in 1981. Um, Mark was the first person who ever made a six-string violin, as, as far as I know, except for maybe some gamba makers back in the uh, 1600s or something. Um, uh, and he had a couple of them that he had built. I found out about it and went out to Long Island and met up with him. This is way pre-internet. Uh, and we started building them out in his dad's uh, woodworking shop because his dad was a carpenter and uh, started knocking out these electric instruments. He had a way of doing them. He showed me how he did it. I started changing them. I started commissioning luthiers to make them for me and once i kind of got into more hollow instruments that i couldn't make um and i sort of split off and did my sort of semi-hollow instruments that i've been doing since the late 80s mark is you know of course has wood violins that's a huge company now that's one of the main makers of electric violins in the world i'm so incredibly proud of what he's done uh to bring electric violins to the world i don't think there's anyone in this in the electric violin world who's done more than he has for for this industry um uh so you know i'm, I'm proud to be work, uh, teaching at his camp this summer in a few weeks the markwood rock camp uh bringing kids from all young kids high school kids and teachers from all over the country to just, you know, geek out on electric violins and to play together and stuff like that. Um, that's the future of strings that I'm really uh, focused on and, and, and want to try to fan those flames, people who are doing that kind of stuff. Um, that's, that's the kind of work that I, I hope to, uh, to add, you know, to help um, add to the mix of mm -hmm. string playing. You know, there's lots of people you know, doing classical stuff. They don't need me to do that. Um, and there are a lot of people who are bringing classical strings to uh, communities that aren't, that don't have access to that. And that's important work. Uh, and I don't ever want to um, underestimate how important it is to bring Mozart to people who are, and Bach to people who, who aren't familiar with it. But my mission is a little different. I'm trying to bring uh, people who don't listen to Mozart and Bach to strings to play them. And how would you play a violin if you never heard Tchaikovsky? So it's sort of a, a, a little bit, 
you know, um, and, and to, it, it's a, mm-hmm. a different thing to bring rock and roll to the concert hall. So it goes, you know, it's a, it's uh, pathways that are going, intersecting, going back and forth and sharing, sharing stuff, but it's uh, all stuff that wasn't happening at all mm-hmm. 40 years ago. That's for sure. Do you have a drum set in your house? Yeah. I do. I was curious <laughs> if you had learned to play drum set early on just to help your, your rhythm playing. Interesting question. Uh, I really mm-hmm. suck at drums. Um, I have it here more for my kid, yeah. who is really kind of more into drums and was playing drums for a while. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's something you really have to practice. And, you know, working with, with Fuchs, with uh, Roy Fuchs, future man Wooten for so many years, you know, and really seeing all the cool stuff. And he's got this great, um, Facebook group called rhythm hackers. And, um, to see, you know, how he overlays fives on top of fours and all these cool patterns and shifting accents that he, that he does so effortlessly. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I picked up a lot Mm -hmm. from working with him, but I can't play it. I, I would never sit, try to sit behind the drums. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's hard. It's hard. you got to practice I'm just that curious. stuff. <laughs> and um, just like a geek question yeah. in terms of your violin playing, do, do you practice yeah. a lot of double stops because mm-hmm. you're playing chords all the time? I do. Um, I, I do. Uh, you know, but not, not as much as like somebody like Billy mm-hmm. Contreras or something who does, I don't know if you're familiar I, I listened with to that Billy. interview, which just, was breakdown. It's like blowing yeah. my mind. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, but you know what, what he can do with that mm-hmm. Western swing stuff where everything mm-hmm. is double, where you have these twin fiddles and it'll be four mm-hmm. part harmony, you know, carefully worked out where, where they're both playing double stops all the time. Um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't do it to that extent, but, um, I definitely use, I think of the violin as a mm-hmm. chordal instrument. Um, and um that's one of the main things that that i'm trying to change in terms of of the the approach to string playing i've just written this this book as i'm sure you've noticed in your in your research called the rhythm string player which is sort of a follow-up to stromboing all right now that you know the technique of stromboing how do you how do you use it how do you apply it uh and um the basic idea is to think of your violin as a chordal instrument like a guitar uh, and treat it like a guitar. And so there are chord patterns that we can play that are basically like bar chording on a guitar. Like if you're going to learn how to play a guitar in your first lesson, you're going to probably learn two chords. You're going to learn E and A, and you're going to be able to go back and forth between an E chord and A open chords, you know. Um, so it, there's similar kinds of stuff on a violin where we can play a G, G7 chord or G dominant chord or G major seven chord. There are all these three finger mm-hmm. patterns. Uh, and so once you learn that, that simple sort of chord thing, you can play um, a two, five, one pattern in any key. And then the question becomes, how do you um, Mm -hmm. strum that with your bow? And how do you do something that's not just the down there, but uses more of the range? You know, breaking a chord with some uh, um, harmonic, uh, melodic kind of thing, or arpeggiated thing. Or, um, let's say, like... You know, where I'm sort of combining playing a chord with... And it sort of ends up the net result being that you're kind of playing chords the way a guitar player does uh and typically in a song you might only need two or three chords and you know you can you know if you're just kind of vamping between two chords whatever um so that's that kind of double stopping is is what you know i'm what i tend to use a little more and chordal kind of 
chordal approach to the instrument. Do you have any kind of routine with your practicing? Do you... No, not really. Um, I, I generally focus on what I need to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've been really focusing on the on ficciones, um, you know, which so much of my practice time uh, is not just playing the violin, yeah. but programming mm -hmm. effects and and making the chart more readable. So I'm like, on that program, on this program, you know. So by the time I actually get to practice it, um, it's kind of focused on drilling mm -hmm. passage work like you would with any concerto, uh, working on intonation. Why am I just phrase always out of tune oh it's a the half step is here not there you know whatever all that kind of classical training um bring that to bear um and then also trying to figure out where am i going to make it where am i going to do my stuff that's more you know where i'm going to put the multiphonics where i'm going you know that kind of stuff and how to interpret the piece um more focused on what i'm what i have to perform next if I'm doing a solo program, I'm going through all my uh, repertoire, my pieces, jamming on them, trying to figure out in the solo parts, what can I do that's different? How can I approach this solo that I'm not just playing the same solos that I always play over those chords? Maybe there's some other cool harmonic interest I can do, or maybe, you know, I'll try um, add harm, you know, just different things that I try to freshen up arrangements a lot of my practice time is is focused on that how can i you know sometimes i'll have a loop and i'll like oh you know what i could add a little melody to that loop and i sort of start changing the arrangement a little bit Th you know arrangements get more and more involved sometimes as i play them over the years and that's the, that's the kind of work i do uh, i'm rarely doing i don't do a lot of scales although sometimes every once in a while i'll, I'll really try to uh, work on my jazz mm -hmm. language a little bit and I'll do stuff like um, playing um, augmented scale arpeggios and, mm -hmm. and I do this thing where I'll go um, one little thing that I do and I teach my, uh, my students is what I call full range one position for mm -hmm. for pentatonics for instance so um, where you go like mm -hmm. let's say an A minor pentatonic mm -hmm. And play the whole scale all the way down as high as you can go in, as, in one position. Then do it B flat. You know, that kind of thing. Or do a similar thing with, um, uh, like I was saying, augmented. You know, and, and just kind of getting those, that muscle memory, um, whole tone scales, stuff like that, you know, um, diminished scales. Um, simple patterns or... So that kind of stuff, sometimes I'll, I'll I'll do just to make sure that muscle memory is there and fresh because those become uh, very useful in improvisations. And that muscle memory, you know, we were talking about improv before, that muscle memory is like your fluency yeah. in a language. That's the exact um, an analogy. They're analogous. Um, I can speak... Uh, off off the cuff i mean without without preparing because i'm fluent in english i could not do yeah. this in spanish okay um i would have to write it out practice it or whatever to some degree until i was more fluent then i could sort of haltingly speak off the cuff whatever but the fact that i'm fluent and and my speech is automatic is something that we take for granted and the same thing with music uh, the, this muscle memory of how to play within a whole tone uh, tonality or how to play within a diminished tonality uh, and to have that muscle memory where I can just play anything within that tonality and, and be able to make that work. That's my fluency. So 
um, it's important to keep that uh, the fluency happens kind of partly in your fingers actually in the mm. the muscle memory in our speech it's kind of in our tongues i think it's all our I brains guess, in our but mouth because yeah it feels it. <laughs> it's a lot of brain but it's actually it a physical way, yeah. part of that you know that people from different language have an accent because their mouths are saying things differently they're not saying ths they're saying t instead of th whatever uh, all of that stuff it's it's the body and the brain are very mm. closely connected when all of this stuff happens you know so uh, a big part of uh, improvising is just being able to tap into into that yeah fluency do you feel like you have perfectionistic tendencies <laughs> yeah yeah i was wondering about that because yeah. you know I, I, but but then you're an improviser and you're a rock musician so that must help you <laughs> counter that it's a very interesting subject an interesting point um you know that you bring up I won't go into great detail about it, but um, yes, to be a violinist, you know, requires a, a real perfectionist kind of mentality. Uh, I think we all are familiar with that. The I think it comes from the need to play yeah. uh, in tune. <laughs> Um, you know, as I like, I, I sometimes tell students, you know, like their, their intonation is just sloppy. It's not getting better. And I'm like, look, you just simply have to be pickier. If it isn't right, fix it, you know, uh, and having good intonation is a, is a matter of being really picky, you know, and being very like, if it's, you know, it's like you're cleaning off a mirror. If there's a little smudge, it's not clean. It's not clean until it's clean, you know, uh, and that's kind of the way intonation is, you know, it's sort of like musical hygiene, you know, uh, and so you can get into this very, you know, that search for perfect intonation and, and it brings out a very perfectionist mentality in us. Uh, and improvising is a very different process. You know, as I was sort of intimating before, this idea of being learning something, being bulletproof and getting up on stage and being able to play it well and performing it well as an athlete. Uh, it's a very different process than sitting down and exploring music and writing something where you're sort of like the the writer you know the old typewriter you know you're writing something you take it out throw it in the trash write something else take it out throw it in the trash that's your process as a creative as a music as a creator is to experiment explore try things and one end of a hundred things that you try is going to sound great um and that's your process uh which is the exact opposite yeah. of performing you get one shot and you got to nail it. Um, so, so I've always had a problem with these two very different things, mm -hmm. processes that are happening, um, and uh, and and that's why I think that the bridge to that is the sort of muscle memory fluency. That's what. Um, that's how you can create spontaneously, uh, and not make it you know, something where you're regretting every note. Whoops, that's the wrong note. Whoops, that's the wrong note. You know, <laughs> you know, um, and to a certain extent, when you're improvising jazz, it's within a very kind of known context. You're not create, recreating the wheel. You know, you're playing often within a key, within a chord, within a chord progression. Um, there's a lot of parameters that if you've done it, you know, before, there's only so many options that you could take. I mean, obviously it's it's free, but within certain limitations, you're not just free to do anything. Uh, and if you are free to do anything and it's free jazz, then there are a lot yeah. less wrong notes. <laughs> so it kind of balances out. Um, somehow. You've been so generous with your your time today, and I just I do like to close out if you if you wouldn't mind around the yeah. idea of like. Either <laughs> the young Tracy Silverman looking back when you're 20, advice you give him, or just young people today. You know, it's kind of different questions, but I'll let you pick. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, what advice I would give? Uh, that's always, uh, always a tricky one because, you know, you don't want to sound like sort of an old fuddy-duddy or something, but... Um, I guess um, one thing f for sure for me, 
I had a lot of arrogance as a young person. I still have a certain amount of that that I've tried to temper. But um, I think if for young people, if you're talented, you know, and if you, you sort of know you've got something going on, um, it's it's really easy to uh, to get absorbed in that. Uh, and it's important to get absorbed in that because that's how you create your voice and create your art. But it's really, I think, uh, what I would tell my younger self is to to be more open to to Daryl putting a tape in the tape deck. Um, and all of the richness of my playing came from people exposing me to new stuff, whether it was my brother turning me on to Frank Zappa um, and Jean-Luc Ponty, who I hadn't heard before, he gave me, and Jimi Hendrix, you know, he gave me some records and sort of blew my mind with that stuff. Uh, or Daryl with Gismonti, or even learning strolling violin stuff. That was not something I actually even wanted to learn, particularly. But all of that, uh, it's all of those all of those experiences that take a, a minute of your time that take you away from yourself. Uh, and force you to listen to somebody else um, that really make you the musician that you are. And I guess what I'm saying is it's more important to listen. The first thing you do as a as a musician is to listen before you start playing. <laughs> make sure you're listening as much as you are playing, listening to other people. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's been amazing meeting you and, and thanks so much for everything. Likewise, wonderful questions. Thank you for being so insightful and having done such incredible research. Wow, it really makes me feel very, very negligent as a as a podcast interviewer. Well, you know, you, but you know your <laughs> you guests, really, right? They're friends of yours. Sometimes, yeah. Usually, I know them personally. Yeah, no, but, you're an yeah. awesome podcaster. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My life is so enriched by getting to know these incredibly inspiring creative guests and their perspectives on their lives and music. Please follow this podcast and sign up for my podcast newsletter to get sneak peeks for upcoming guests and find out about newly published transcripts.